So that's, that's a big part. We try to anticipate and then, again, understand the predictability of the game. The things that happen randomly, maybe once or twice in a game, we don't really overanalyze those because those are the random events that happen in the game. <coughs> Soccer is a chaos sport. It's going to have those random events. We look for the predictable stuff. And then we break the game down. A lot of you would have seen this many times, the four moments of the game. Attack the organization when the team's in possession of the ball in organized play. The moment the ball is turned over, the defensive transition. Then if the opponent secured the ball, how we defend it in an organized way or on set plays or still balls. And then when we win the ball back, the attack and transition. All right, and then if you want to even simplify it even more, well, I should set plays, of course, but if you want to simplify it even more, you can have it just in possession and out of possession. When your team has the ball, when your team doesn't have the ball, and include the transition moments. All right, so that's, that's how we look at the game, and, and the rhythm of the game has those four moments interchanging. Fluidly, sometimes you don't even get into organized defending or attacking. It could be attacking transition to defending transition and back and forth for certain moments of the game. It can have those sort of rhythms. So that's how we break down the game. And in terms of workflow, the first part is observation. We try to observe in most game, most teams, three games. Why three? Because normally you can see trends in three games. If you watch one, it could be, you know, maybe they play the top team in the league and they sat in a low block, but when they play a team in the middle or lower part of the table, they play differently. So we want to understand, you know, again, how teams not only play in single games, but across multiple games. So minimum of three, ideally five. And when we try to look at the games, we try to pick opponents uh, that the team we're going to analyze that's similar to us, all right, that has similar identity style play to us. For you as a referee, probably the most relevant would be the last three games, right? Because then for you, you can see, uh, again, uh, trends and maybe if you can get game a game of the two teams that you're actually going to be refereeing and officiating, that's probably be the best footage to look at. So the observation part, then the analysis. We break the game down the four moments: attacking, defending, attacking, transition, defending, transition, set plays. We break it down, and then the key thing is then you reflect. You take your notes. I like to have, have pen and paper on the software too. We can write notes. And then we try to connect all the, again, indicators, all the, the main themes from the analysis. And then we consolidate that. So we'll do a deep dive, we'll break it down, we'll do lots of video edits, and then we'll simplify it into some main themes and build them into a movie package. All right, so then we can go present this information to the players. So things that we sometimes break down as coaches, we don't show the players because it's too in-depth. We'll strip it back and simplify for them to maybe one or two key, key clips, okay? But that's, that is really the workflow, the observation, the analysis, if you have data, yeah, access to the data, that helps too. Reflect and connect. As referees, get your crew together as well. It'd be great if you have your crew together and watch and then come to uh, some common decisions on how the opponent's gonna play, the teams are gonna play, and then consolidate that. If you're gonna present the players as a, as a coach. <coughs> And then in terms of systems, um, tools that we use, these help because they speed up the workflow. So you're not, you're not wasting time, you can get efficiency. We use the Huddle products. So we use a mix of Huddle Online, OPDL, I know that they're using Huddle now. Um, all the league exchange is set up on there. Um, I'm sure match officials, if you're working the OPDL, you may want to get on that. Uh, league One, I know there's some cooperation with Huddle too. But we use Huddle because again, we can build databases, we can build um, video edits very, very quickly. I can analyze three games in one day. That's how fast the software allows it to work. The other software you can use is Yscout. It's Yscout's online. It has a massive database of games, NCAA, US, uh, sorry, uh, Canadian universities, League One games are on there. Again, huge platform helps because they already do the edits for you. And then video editing, we use iMovie, Final Cut Pro, and uh, Coach Paint. Coach Paint allows us to uh, do video animations. So again, we can highlight the key 
areas of technical, tactical performance that we want to show the players. It creates a good visual for, for the individuals. Now, you're probably thinking, all those software have a price, a price point to them? Absolutely, mine will be free. As long as you have the video, you put it in iMovie, you can splice it, you can create a three minute movie like that. So take advantage of the free software. If you have access to higher end software, then again, that will, that will obviously help too. Okay? But again, take, take advantage of that because again, every, everyone's gonna have their own reality, but I think with the free software, you can still do some, some video analysis. Now, tennis soccer, give you a little bit of uh, how we break the game down even more. So we've got our in possession, so attacking transition, attacking in an organized way. We build it into three phases, build, create, finish. Same with the referees. I think as a referee, it's good to know how is the team going to build up. They play short, so you may want to adopt a higher start position because you know it's going to be in a certain area of the pitch where Again, the keeper's going to restart play. If it's longer, you might be able to anticipate, uh, I need to take a further position so I can see more of a direct play or almost to an angle. I'm not a referee, but I can imagine those are things you have to consider when you're on the field. Trade and, and finish um, are how teams look to break lines, their, 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 um, their trends in terms of, again, how they progress the ball what sort of numbers they get in the attacking third, what behaviors, is it more of a passing combination, is it more 1v1, uh, is it fast counterattacks that creates and finishes their attack, those are things that, um, again, we analyze. Every club nowadays has an identity, I'm not going to go through our identity, but you can see some of our behaviors and principles listed. Whenever you do an analysis, it's good to think about what is that team's identity and style of play, because again, that helps you understand their trends. So that's the in possession, this is out of possession. We look at how um, they prevent the attacks. So do they have a high press? Is it a low block? Um, do they set a high line of engagement and wait till the opponent makes uh, two, three passes and then they jump, or is it immediate pressure? Again. Um, that helps. How do they defend in midfield areas? Is it man-to-man, -man, player marking? Is it uh, zonal marking? Is it mix? Do they have a high back line, which means there's going to be a lot of balls in behind and the game's going to be a lot of end-to-end? -end, or you know, do they, again, have good balance in how they keep their team shape? All right, so again, um, those are just some, some simple things to consider when you look at, uh, again, out of possession. We also break the game down into five lanes. Lanes one and five being the Y channels, two and four being the half space, and then three being that central channel. This helps us in terms of, again, being very specific on pitch geography. So for example, when we defend, we want to help, we want to force the opponent into lanes one and five. Why? Because for us, that keeps them further away from that central channel where obviously is the biggest threat. So we say nothing through, nothing behind, two, three, four, if they're gonna get any spaces in lane one and five. And that's, that again gives clarity to the individual players in the team on a collective level. All right. Does anyone know, from a referee standpoint, lane one and five, what we call lane one and five? We, the free zone, we call it the free zone. And in the free zone, you know what, the, what, what, what does it mean for a referee when play is in the free zone? What do we need to do? I mean, it depends, but what are some things that are found near the free zone? Yep. Heavy challenges. Heavy challenges, right? When the <coughs> players are up against the touch line. I heard something over here, which is correct. The benches, right? Fouls right in front of the bench. So being able to understand the type of challenges that are coming in, reading the players, so we'll hear him talk about, you know, in the future, but being able to read the player's body language, is it a high press, are there big challenges coming in, means that us as referees, we need to adjust to either be closer, to have better angles, to anticipate the challenges that are coming in, so that we're not standing 20 yards away in the center circle when a big challenge comes in in front of the, in front of the benches, right? So. Those are free zones. So interesting to hear that you know part of the 
you know, set up and team tactics is to try and push players there when they lose possession, right? And what we're going to do for today, we're going to look at, um, this is a recent analysis I did on Haiti. It was during the Under-17 Women's Hockey Cup. This was the last game of the tournament. Um, the reason why I picked Haiti, they're a very unique team with a very unique style. Okay, so um, again, I think it'll bring out some interesting insights that we can, we can look at. So we'll look at their out of possession. Their shape was a 4-2-3-1, so back four, two screens, holding mids, a number 10, and two wide players, and a number nine. Um, it's, it was a high press, so they pressed immediately when the opponent had ball possession. Um, they would jump their number 10 or their wide forward onto one of the center backs. So it wasn't just the one nine, they jumped other players out of that midfield unit to again get pressure on the back line. Player marking in midfield, so it was very tight and aggressive in midfield. Um, and their last defender, they'd always have either the number 17 or the number three, a little bit deeper than their back line, which means they can see the depth in behind, um, which again was an opportunity for us to hurt them in behind. All right, which again, if you're an AR, that's important. If they're, if they're leaving somebody really deep, almost like a sweeper. All right, let's look at, um, this is Haiti's press. So you can see their front four, the, the, the number nine, the two wingers, and number 10. And I'm just gonna pause there. So there's a the behavior right away. Their number 10 is jumping on the center back. So immediate pressure. In an area where, um, again, if they steal the ball cleanly, it's a, it's a massive goal threat. The player marking, how tight they are. So again, you know that if that midfielder turns and they're that tight, could be fouls from a referee point of view. And they really commit numbers in the wide areas. That's their traps. That's where they're going to try to hunt and steal the ball back. Direct, when they win it, they're looking for the number nine. They don't win it, but they're still on the hunt. They're still chasing. And then from a, a coaching point of view, we want our midfielders to be on the blind side of their player marking, off the shoulders, in the space, because you can manipulate them, find the pockets, and then when you do that, you now have a player facing forward in front of the back line, look at the last defender, okay, and, and there's massive space in behind. All right, there's better timing and execution on the last pass with the run, you know, she's got a great opportunity to attack the box. But even here, they only defend with one wide, and then that player is late, diving in. That's one instance of video. Here again, another clip, and the 10's jumping, the exact same strategy. We're saying maybe one of our pivots can split those two opponents to get the ball in turn. But here, they find the pocket in front and behind, the last defender. So what's the purpose of a high press? I'm not asking the coaches, but asking <laughs> the referee. What's the purpose of players doing a high press? To cause turnovers, right? To try, and, to try and turn the ball over and create pressure. So Joey mentioned a couple things, and I heard a whisper. Somebody said, where's the referee? <laughs> it, there's very good, there's very good sound here, right? <laughs> So we need to recognize, and we've seen a couple clips. The very first one was high press. Joey talked about the players are in close proximity to one another. The referee, you know, there, there's the possibility of a turnover. So the referee needs to have an angle, needs to be close, not too close, but close to anticipate a potential turnover. And, but also we need to remember, and, and the closeness, we have to be able to see the fouls too. It's not only about the turnover, and then we need to be ready to react. So Dave did a couple drills today where there was some fast move, where you know, some, and Michelle did too on the counter. Speed, being able to change our direction when there's a turnover is really, really important. We saw the players come into the free zone. That's when the referee thought to themselves, I better get a bit closer, right? We need to be able to read that. The second video was less of a hot, they're pressing, but it's more of a medium press. 
And we have to be careful not to overreact to the players being close, because if then we get too close, we saw this lovely they play out, because if they can get out of the press, it usually means that they have some space and there's going to be some transition through the midfield. So good reaction to say, where's the referee? Because the referees need to be able to react, and especially on these short goal kicks. Right before, the goal kicks were all coming long. Almost nobody does long goal kicks anymore. So some, the pressure of these teams that are standing right outside of the penalty area, and they're just waiting, and you can see them, you have to recognize that and, and, and adapt as a referee, right? It's okay to take a position and realize, oh, crap, but if it becomes a trend, you need to change your position to be able to see, okay? All right, we're gonna look at, again, one couple clips, and this is about the behaviors of their back line. So this gets later in the game, as you can see now, they're getting stretched. Referee anticipating, right? There's no pressure. And then the behaviors of their back line, because again, it's, it's player oriented. You can see if somebody shows off the front to get into a pocket, the center back jumps. And now they get really disconnected. And that's where it op op offers opportunities for players from deep positions to run in behind. It opens up gaps. We call them, we need a movement excellence to really hurt that back line. And actually, Mexico scored from that. Right, but at the referee anticipated there was no pressure. What did Michelle say this morning? Don't need to look at a player by themselves with the ball. Right there, unless they're very bad. Like if I was playing, I might trip myself over the ball and foul myself, but most players won't. So you don't need to watch the ball, the anticipation in the middle of the field, so that when the transition came through, she wasn't running 40 yard sprint because she stood back where there was no pressure. So good anticipation. And this is an example of transition play because they, they overcommit numbers in attack. Mexico finds it finds their link player, their jumping behaviors, look how deep the last defender is. So again, the quickness of the referee to have to get back to position of the lines, these AR being in line. But from a coaching point of view, it's saying defend with attack in mind, have a link, have somebody friending you behind because if they're gonna drop that deep with one defender, it's definitely a, a window where you can get two or three attackers in behind. And did we see the referee's movement? Did you see what she did at first at the start? Is it possible? Yeah, right here. It's like Murphy's Law yeah. that when the referee takes a step backwards, the ball is going to go 30 yards in front, right? And so the referee knew, so she took a step backwards because she was a little bit in the way, and then it becomes a fast transition. The word that we like to use is dynamic and explosive. Referees need to be, you, we've all watched World Cup games where you watch the referees run through the middle of the pitch and you're like, ah, it's beautiful. This is the moment where you don't, you're looking ahead and you are in a full sprint to catch up. If you catch them, now she never catches the ball, but she doesn't slow down. Because the other Murphy's Law is the moment you catch the ball and you slow down, that player kicks it 30 yards into the penalty area and there's a decision in the penalty area. So as referees, we need to be comfortable and I think that square that we did this morning, being a little bit in front of the ball and continuing through in anticipation of the next phase. So this referee's transition when she realized that she was now behind and because that defender's so deep, she's not gonna get bailed out by an offside flag, which sometimes we hope, right? When I have the comp system and I'm swearing, shit, 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 shit. All I want is my assistant referee to put the flag up and be like, thank God. But here, with a player that plays so deep, you are not going to get bailed out. So you have to be able to move through, right? So that's something important to know as well. I apologize for anyone offended by my swearing. That's not that bad. But uh, if you ever heard my comp system, it's uh, much uh, worse than that. <laughs> And the last thing, just a quick one on, on set plays. We saw when the ball goes out of play, they turn their back to the ball. Opportunities for quick set plays, quick throws. 
Um, and right away they were able to get across and here again, slow to get set, players have their back to the ball, free player underneath, and we were saying just take the quick restart. Get it as soon as it goes out, play it in, and then play and join, secondary movements, numbers in the box. And why is it important to know that teams want to take quick restarts? Yes. You have to be paying attention. You have to be paying attention. You know, yeah. They want to keep working with the momentum. They want momentum, so you need to be aware of that as a referee if it was a free kick or you don't want to get in the way, right? Is there, you know, if you see this referee, you know, oftentimes we stop, we're like, ah, oh, yeah. This time, it's like quick signal and we need to move and anticipate the next phase. I mean, there's lots of videos of goal kicks, quick goal kicks, one, two pass, and it's in the penalty area. This, you know, quick throw in, one, you know, dribble, one pass, you know, right in the middle of the penalty area. So if the referee comes too far over or is too static, She's not going to be in the middle of the penalty, you know, in the in the middle of the field, closer to where the next phase of play is. So understanding the quick restarts is so that we can anticipate, so that we're not caught behind, we're not surprised that the team has taken a quick free throw, right? We're not like, you know, and then we're in the wrong angle and we can't see because there's a number of these videos. What is the outcome then? A goal. Right, and we need to be there in case there's a challenge, in case there's another situation that we need to be able to. So I think that's really good that to highlight some of these quick restarts. Because not all there are teams who do their best to take the slowest restart they possibly can, which you also need to be aware of, right? And from a coaching point of view, I look at things like this, where players turn their back to the ball, back to the ball, so they're not ready to defend the quick throw. The other thing I'm looking at is their numbers to defend the box. You see they only have the one center back in the whip of the goal. This player's late to recover. We get the ball back here, you play an early cross. You've got numbers, you got an opportunity to get good numbers in the box with space. Now, summary from the out of possession clips, it's a high pressing team. It's a team that likes to be on the front foot. Player marking, they're aggressive in duels. The last defender can see space behind the back line, and again, they, they can see quick restarts. So if I had to simplify the four trends um, that I think were important for that team, those would be the four areas in, um, that I would, I would highlight, okay? And they all align to the clip. So you have the video evidence when you go show players, or you need as an officiating team and you're talking about the upcoming game, you've got the video evidence to again back it up. Now, let's look at in possession. So that's their shape. They play really wide center backs. This was interesting. So you think about the laws of the game. They were playing wide center backs right at the edge here. So rather than having our center forward start here, where they're going to get their late to press the center back, we have them start here. So they're going to go that wide. Well, okay, then I'd rather make a three yard run than, than a 10 yard run. So that's something that we adjusted. Um, they play with two pivots, high full backs, a number 10, and then their front three. The trends were, um, they can adapt sometimes, sometimes they'll push this number six up and play with one holding and two attacking mids, so we're ready for that. It's a mixed build up, sometimes it was short, sometimes it was long, but every time they got pressed, it was direct. So anytime the trigger was there for us to press, they were looking long into the, into the channels through their number nine, who was their key player, um, and you'll see that in the clips. The number nine, Etienne, was their, their main goal scorer. She scored seven of their eight goals going through the game against us. If you look at this image in the middle of the pitch, like, you know, when we talk about the lineups and, and the, the, you know, the four, two, four, three, what does it, like, for referees, does that mean anything? You don't know? Like, so, if we look at the middle of, you know, we, so we, we talk about number three, number 17 being wide, and how teams can exploit that. So maybe from a dog so or a tactical foul, we need to consider that. But the middle of the pitch, it's pretty, it's full, eh? So understanding whether the team plays through the middle, like do they pass through the middle or are they playing direct long balls over is important because as a referee, have you ever been in the middle third of the pitch and thought like, I'm in everybody's way all of the time? 
yes often, right? You're like, holy crap, I'm trying to get out of the player's way and there's a central midfielder that feels like they're shadowing you and you're trying to get out of their way. So understanding a team that you can see build up and they build up nicely, usually a referee we can adapt and we see them coming and we can get out of their way and we understand. But teams that are really lots of players in the middle of the pitch, means as a referee, we need to try and find spaces out of their way. Now, if they're going to kick from number three to number 20 every time, it's a different story. But you can see there's a, there's a fair number of players in the middle of the pitch, and that's important for referees so that we can try and find the spaces so we're not getting in players' way if they're going to play through the middle. Now, the, the use of statistics, this is from Y Scout. So this is um, the last four games that Haiti played, USA, Mexico, El Salvador, Costa Rica. And you can see the keeper's range. So for our back line, you know, she could hit well over the halfway line. Not consistently, but there's trends where she can, and there is time. So they had to be really good at dropping back foot, killing space, reading the flight of the ball. To be honest with you, I don't know if anybody watched the game, they actually scored against us off a direct play. The first ball from the keeper, we didn't set properly, our line was too high, in behind the number nine ran onto it, became a foot race with the goalie. So even though we knew, still in the heat of the game sometimes, uh, yeah, it, it can happen. So Michelle's drill just today about the don't look back and wait while the goalkeeper's releasing the ball is for this exact reason, right? If, if this goalkeeper is consistently kicking into the halfway, there's no need to be looking behind. You need to get there to see the drop zone or to anticipate a team that's playing too high, now it jumps out and we're on a big counterattack. So that's why it was the exact situation after we showed the yellow and red card for the assistants. And then once the goalkeeper's releasing, you need to get there, and it doesn't. you don't need to watch her release it. There's people to help you, your assistants. You need to get there so that you can be ready for the next phase. Here, we'll look at a couple goal kicks. <coughs> So this is a, a short one on a still ball, but you can see, look at the width of the center backs. Gets there late, that's what we adjusted our start position, but once there's pressure, the center back's gonna go, go along, direct down the side. And they're looking for the number nine. And there's their front three. So again, just a good overview of their shape, but again, their trend's under pressure. Here again, we'll play short, we said we had to be alert. They're not set from a coaching point of view because they're not set. If we can get pressured, maybe we can catch them not prepared for the short build. There's their two and a one shape. There's their winger shallow. And then long again, looking for the number nine. And she's chasing. And then here's an example of the keeper's goal kick range. And that, and that being the hot spot for the keeper. So for the referee, you saw them speak about the range. And it was a beautiful, nice red square. We call that the drop zone, right, where we anticipate the ball is going to drop. You see where the referee started, right, way outside in the front of the drop zone, right? We want to be able to see in between the players, so we need to be able to adjust. And in all of the level of soccer, sometimes, we have teams that have great range, and we have teams that don't have such great range, right? And with the advent of the short free kick, often our, our first reaction is to go exactly where we've been told to go, which is right, you know, where the drop zone is a little bit on the outside, automatically, right? Automatically we go there, we need to read the players. So here you can see everybody's back, we're expecting a long ball. But on that previous one, everyone was up. And it also creates a little bit where we're uncomfortable because now we're on the, our wrong diagonal if the ball goes to the other side. So we need to be on our toes, ready to react to some of the changes because just because it looks like they're gonna kick short doesn't mean they are. But this is where reading the players, looking not at the ball, but at what the players are doing is really, really important. And understanding that this type of formation, or if it looks like this, it's likely to be a long ball. If it's not, that's why we're fit and why we're explosive. 
and we can, because we're not always going to make the right choice. Just like players, they're going to choose the wrong decision one time. One time we're going to anticipate and they're going to, the ball's going to, you know, in women's soccer, often there's more, there's not as many passes. There's more turnovers. So when we anticipate too much, sometimes we will have made the wrong decision and that's what leaves our fitness, our ability to change direction, our speed to get us back in the right place. And, w and why we study still balls? Because again, it's an opportunity to defend in an organized way. These are the these are the predictable moments where, um, again, if the team's identity is they're going to go long eight out of ten times, well, just get ready, get set quickly. You can anticipate the, the again where the hot spot's going to be, and then you can win eighty percent plus of those first and second balls. I've seen so many different game analysis. Some uh, analysts that I've worked with would not study these moments enough. They'd be like, oh, it's just long ball. But then you go out and play and your team wins 20% of the first and second balls and then you're getting done in behind on the second phase with your back line that high in their half. It's a problem. So it, it, again, it's, it, it is important. Arm, you have your hand up? Yeah, Joey, quick question. The, the screen where you had the goalkeeper distribution yeah. of the four games or the five games that you had, do you take into consideration um, the elements of the game, like is it win factor at all? Like is that documented in your data collection? Absolutely, if we see it was a game where we high win, and let's say for example, the one game against Costa Rica, the, the range was a lot higher, but the other games was further back then, that right away you can tell there's some sort of uh, condition factor in there. Yeah. yeah, that actually goes in the match for high wins, low wins, rain, type of pitch condition for sure. And that's something we have to take into account. You know, when the ball gets hung up, we need to be able to get to the drop zone. Because you know, they might be trying to kick it to half, and they might be all lined up at half. But reality, when it gets the ball goes high and it hangs, we need to be able to adjust so that we are being able to see whether it's contact above the shoulder, whether it's holding, that kind of thing in between the players in the drop zone, to the best of our ability. Now here's here's uh, the keeper's range on a drop kick. It's a quick release. So she tries to catch you before you're organized. And again, the range is a lot higher now. And this is where your back line can get stretched back to front, your, your team shape, and then they're ready for the second ball to go 1v1. And they're trying to get fouls, and obviously from that, from that video. But here again, the keeper gets the ball, quickly gets to the edge, and it's a quick release. Michelle will be yelling at this referee in her microphone today. Do you remember what she was saying? Do you see the referee kept watching the goalkeeper with the ball? Watching, watching, watching. Then it gets released and she's 20 to 25 yards behind. Because all it takes is a flick or you know the, team, the, the defending team to miss headers. And this attacker is, you know, with speed, who is their target player, is now by themselves going to get on the net and we're 40 yards behind now because the minute it touches it, the ball's going to accelerate and we're too slow. So when Michelle was saying turn and run, she really means turn and run. In this case, obviously, you know, we have to know too, like if they go like this and then they roll it, we need help from our team, which we talked about. We had some, some good communication today, but I'm not saying be like totally, you know, Michelle wasn't saying turn and don't be aware of what's happening, but when the kick is coming, if it's coming over your head, you should be trying to run to catch that ball. Not actually catch the ball, but <laughs> get up to the ball. <laughs> and what we're saying from our, our team point of view is when the ball goes directly, looking for the number nine, whoever steps to the first ball and challenges the ball, the other members of the back line tuck, and then our midfield players attaching to the second ball. And like I said, they caught us on one of these in the game. <clears throat> Looks like she's gonna delay, puts the ball down, and then looking for, for the wide forward. And why I put that clip in is you, you watch the opposition player, Again, behaviors, turns her back to the ball, not, not aware of the player on the opposite shoulder. And, that, and now they find an easy pass to get out of the press. 
And so here's an example. The referee doesn't turn and run, but can be moving up the field. There was no pressure, right? There were, there were, the players were close together because direct play, it, it can really be one pass, two pass, penalty area. If you watch the US, one pass, two pass, penalty area, really means you can't stand and watch and say we're gonna pass over there. If the ball's going there, you better, even if I need to keep looking, I better be looking, but if I'm not moving and gaining the space that I can, I will be too far behind to make a decision. So here, we're not leaving and running because the ball, but we're, we should be anticipating where the next phase is. If pressure comes, then we can adapt but there was no pressure, right? So she should be moving up the field while keeping an eye, because there's still players there, keeping an eye, and she will have made up the space where she won't need to sprint, she'll be able to transition nicely, right? So we take the space. If we can anticipate, I mean, a, a referee that can anticipate well in a game that has some flow to it, will only need to sprint in very, very key situations because they will already be there because they'll have anticipated um, anticipated the game properly. And in here, when we talk about um, their frets, they're number nine. So these these black um, diamonds that you see on this uh, image, this pitch map, those are where the goals came from. Nine, 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 nine. So you can tell who's who's the primary fret. Um, and then here's a video of her, opportunistic, lifts her transition, will pounce on any air. So here, the feather's late to, to attack the ball, the ball bounces, skips fire. And these are things that happen at youth level. Less at the, at, at the pro level, because they, they have better timing and, and reading in the game, but these things happen. Here they jump out, aggressive in the tackle, nine's ready. So this needs speed. Counterattacks usually need speed, right? We anticipated that the ball was gonna play out. It doesn't play out. We need to get close now and make up the space. It's the moment to show all of your training and your great training speed. She's physical, so she can out-muscle, out-maneuver uh, defenders. Uh, you'll see here. With her back to goal. Watch how she shields. One, two, gets up, finds a gap in the score. She actually won the golden ball at the tournament, by the way. So she was the voted the best player in the tournament. Did we see the referee's position on the corner kick? Good. So I think it's the recommended starting position. What would be your advice in this scenario? Massimo Busaka at FIFA says the penalty area is your life, <coughs> right? Referees' careers are won and lost in the penalty area because players' teams win and lose in the penalty area. Small movement. It takes two meters, two steps to get a better angle in the penalty area, okay? So to stand outside the penalty area while there's six players challenging for the ball, in this case, Nothing happens, she scores, it's clean. But you need to be able to see between the players, and that means small movement. Small movement, two steps inside, two steps outside. You, Michelle said don't stand on the penalty spot, <coughs> totally agree, but it's not like there is a electric current that's gonna zap us when we step inside the penalty area. But if you go in the penalty area, you have to be able to get out quickly because referees do not want to be there. But here, she needs to have an angle, so likely move more to the right so that she can see this. It might be fine to start there. I mean, we're actually starting much more in the middle now so that we can see in between, but we have to be dynamic on set pieces. We need to be dynamic. Yes. As referees, we don't talk about zones 14 and 17 often, and we should, because exactly that. Absolutely. So really, like, the small movements around the penalty area used to be, you know, you get to the, come up to the penalty area line, you're like, I'm close, right? Because everything feels close once you're at the top of the penalty area. But it really is about being able to move this way, 
two steps this way. The penalty area line parallel to the touch line on this side is the referee's responsibility. The ARs can't help you if it's inside outside. You need to make sure that if the ball comes around that you're moving so that you can make a decision there. So small movements, really important. It's so easy to get there, especially if there's been a counterattack, to get to the top of the penalty area and say like, oh, yes, I'm here, I'm so fast. And then to have a terrible angle and not be able to make the correct decision. So we have to be dynamic and set pieces in particular because we're anticipating something and then here, there's a lot of, I mean, it's not chaotic because there's not a hole, but there's people swinging on the ground, the player falls, she gets up, there's potential handball. So you need to be able to see it in the penalty area. Yes? Has there been any coaching for referees change since the restart if you get hit with the ball inside the penalty area change? The restart? It, well, the drop ball is to the goalkeeper. But never used to be. Correct. So <coughs> the coaching for referees change, is that maybe why they're a little bit more reluctant to go inside the penalty? I don't think so. I think the messaging is we need to be in a credible position to make those decisions. I'm not saying that we should be six yards inside the penalty area. I'm saying you might you might have to take a step in when the play is down in the goal area to get the right angle. Here she stays deliberately actually three or four yards outside. I'm not saying she needs to go in, but she definitely needs to move to the right so she can see. There needs to be an angle so she can see. Yeah. So body position on, on where the ref is, according to where the play is, so if the ball's coming from the corner, would she be keeping corner to that corner in order to come in, or so she can have a better view? Is that correct? Yeah, so I think, so typically the start position used to be there. Okay. What I would say is now, now if the ball's gonna drop to the near post, she's not in a bad position, right? Because she's looking down and through. If the ball was going to come more into near the penalty spot, she probably can start in the middle of the penalty arc. Because what you're trying to see is in between the players. So we have to be able to adapt however the players set up and then where we anticipate the ball is going, which is a little bit about understanding their set pieces and reading the play. So here, because the ball drops near post, it's not a terrible position to start, as long as she can see in between the players. But the minute that the ball starts to move, she has to move. She needs to be there to be able to make that decision. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not imagining it. Yeah, no. I'm watching it. It's the trajectory that the ball is being played. So if yeah. you find yourself in a really difficult spot, then you're not going to see all the Correct. Right? So Correct. That's why I was just saying that maybe you go to the corner and you come in as the ball's getting into that area, you anticipate where it's going to go. So you're talking about the other side of the penalty arc? Yeah, just where she is here. Yeah. On the opposite side, just a little bit on the opposite side. Kitty corner for that corner, but then coming in. So the, the one thing is the assistant referees on the other side. So as match officials, we're also trying to be able to see our, our assistant referees as well because they're we're trying to communicate with them as well. So we try to have as much as possible. The ball is going to come in between the two of us so that we're looking this way. Um, we always say the correct position is the one where you get the right decision, but I think likely the best position is to start out and to come and to move in. Can I just yeah, absolutely. To, to just to add something like, I have two points. Number one, the blocks of players is where it triggers us where to start. So if there's two blocks, one near post and one far post, we have to split the difference because we don't know. If everybody's on, in this, they're mostly all near post, so it's logical to assume that that's where the ball's gonna come. But the word starting position, I guess that's two words, is the most important. It's literally a snapshot. And then like you said, the trajectory of the ball dictates do we need to move laterally quick right or quick left or maybe up or maybe forward. So the problem that the referees get into trouble with is they start there and they're like, ah, oh, look at me, I'm in the best position. And they don't adjust to where the players move and where the ball's going. And so now they're dead in the water because they haven't adjusted to the trajectory. <coughs> Yeah, but you don't want the air making that call. Right, right. Yeah. So we, as a referee, here in the middle of the pitch, this is 100%, 99.9% the referee's decision. I would, me, I would, if my AR ever put their flag up in this scenario for something other than an offside, you wouldn't want to hear my comp system recording because it would not be very pleasant. Now, there are situations where there's a weird handball that I'm blocked from, absolutely, but this is my air, like, Generally speaking, 99% of that penalty area, I'm making, I need to be in a position to make that decision. I have to have an opinion 
to make that decision. I'm just saying because at the national level, I see that. But at the club level, I've, seen, sure. I've seen many different things. It's, I mean, refereeing is experience. Right. And until somebody tells them, otherwise they're looking at the loss of the game that speaks, that shows that position exactly, it doesn't give them, you know, it really is about, oh, okay, yeah, it makes sense. Now I know why I did it. And you, Joey talked at the beginning about, you know, analyzing. And it's not only analyzing the teams before, but if we, you know, it's analyzing us after, right? Just like, you know, Joey will look at his team after. It's about us looking at situations where maybe we made a great decision and I want to see what I look like, you know, wh why did I get myself in the right position to do it? Or I missed something and it's about saying, okay, what could I have done differently to get the angle? So let's say there was a handball there when the player was on the ground and we missed it. Well, if we look at this, we can say we probably didn't have the angle to be able to see that because we didn't move. So it's about ad adapting and teaching grassroots referees too. I mean, we want them to, you know, it's, it's a stepwise progression just like coaches and uh, players are, right? We start, what's a foul, what's not a foul, <laughs> and then we move um, through the system. All right, we're almost done this at the back end. So because you know number nine's a threat, Obviously, from a coaching point of view, we always got two. We, we want to get two around her. Front and back, double team. Don't give her space. Referees watch for the foul. <laughs> yeah, be aggressive. No turns. Um, once we win it, they're on a hunt. So look for the exit pass. Try to get out of that zone where we recover the ball. You can see the U.S. did a great job every time she got the ball. Two front and back. Again, uh, for a referee, obviously, you know they have a key player. The opponents can be aggressive against that individual, so you can anticipate that sort of behavior. And I love this clip here where ball, body, clean, shoulder to shoulder. She wins it, and then she finds the midfielder on an exit pass. And now they've got time and space. So that was just, again, a key player highlighting that, and then some strategies to, to again, nullify the threat. Now, our summary of them, in, in possession, they're direct, keep her quick release, the number nine, and then opportunistic in transition. You can see there wasn't a real structure to their transition, but um, any sort of space you give them, any opportunity to get a ball in behind, um, they're living for that. This is another thing that we, uh, that we highlighted was they like the time waste, especially early in the game. They'll have a player go down and they'll stay on the ground and they're trying to delay the game and get the, uh, the physiotherapist on. We're saying to our team, just play the whistle blow. Let the referee decide when they stop play, we keep playing. We're also going to keep doing it again and again and again. And before you know it, uh, 10 minutes has gone past the game because of that. So I don't know how much, I mean, I haven't refereed grassroots soccer for a while. This is a problem in CONCACAF. We actually call the stretcher on. If we call the doctor, the stretcher comes immediately because teams delay. This is a tactic that teams do often. In this scenario, did, did we think there was a foul? No. That's the defender, so no foul. It's in the penalty area. I think in this case, in this game, the right decision is to, to continue playing. Right, the team is trying. Is, you know, if she hurt herself, she hurt her. Own, her she hurt herself. Right, she's not. You know, it's not a, a serious injury. And the I think the outcome here is correct. Play continues. A goal is scored. We need to, as referees, have many tools to deal with player behavior because in some cases like there's you know at grassroots level I don't think we'll have too many players I mean at senior men's and well, I, call, I still call it old timers even though it's really over 35 and I'm well over 35 I think that's what we used to call it back in the day it was old timer soccer but you know yeah we might see it there but we have to have multiple tools because you know if this was in the first minute of a game and it was in the middle of the field and play was starting to come back around that player. Our primary goal is player safety. You know, in the middle of the pitch, we have to be careful and make sure we need to be able to 
you know, we would probably start by saying, do you need the doctor to get up? You know, eventually, when we see that this is becoming a tactic, then we have to try different things. So is it we call the doctor on right away and that player has to leave? You know, we've heard the, do we, for, you know, is the player forgotten for 30 minutes on the touchline? That's a that's something that's not, it is a tool in our toolbox. We have to be careful, right, about doing that. There's, there are, but we have to kind of find different techniques to deal with players. Some players will respond really well, just, you know, I, you know, I try something in one game, the next game I try the exact same thing, and it backfires. So in this case, it is the right decision. There is no foul. The correct outcome is, is goal. But we, you know, if the goalkeeper is down in the middle of the penalty area, there's, you know, there's different considerations. I can't speak to what would happen here, but and you have to see what happens. But there's those considerations as well. But in this case, in Concacaf, a lot of the Caribbean countries.